Hello, St. Paul, and I guess anyone else who's been making use of these studies on our YouTube page. This is the Bible study for this week. This is Revelation 18. If you are here by mistake, well, I hope you stick around, unless you were looking for a different Revelation video, in which case, try again. This is chapter 18. But if you're here for Revelation 18, that is what this is, and we're going to jump into kind of introducing the chapter. And I want to remind you a little bit of where we're coming from. If you watched chapter 17, then this is going to be a little bit of a review. If I start talking and you have no idea what I'm talking about, I would encourage you, go ahead and go back and watch chapter 17. Chapter 18 obviously makes a lot more sense if you've watched 17 first. And 17 makes more sense if you watch 16 first. And 16 makes more sense if you watch 15 first. Etc, etc, etc. We have all the videos if you want to go back and watch them. So, but as we walk into 18 from chapter 17, the last chapter we saw was a vision of, of the devil's two servants. And it kind of focused in on the, the prostitute, who I, I throughout the study, I, I did my best to call the faithless one instead. <clears throat> and a lot of that comes from the, the kind of the symbolism of the prostitute and how that character, that profession is used symbolically and metaphorically throughout throughout the scriptures, even dating back to the Old Testament. Actually, it was my personal devotion this morning. I read through Hosea, and the prostitute is used through the entirety of Hosea to talk about the faithlessness of Israel. So we, we talked about kind of this, this figure of the faithless one and what she had done and how she enticed people to walk away from God, to turn their back on God. And at the end of 17, we saw a little bit of the beginning of her punishment. And as we pick up in 18, we're going to see the, the final judgment of the faithless one. We're going to see kind of the conclusion of a lot of that judgment. But then we're also going to see the reaction of, of the world and of heaven and, and how those kind of compare to one another. So that's kind of where we're coming from. And we're from there, we're going to head straight into the text. I would encourage you um, have the text in front of you. I'll, I'll put it up on the screen as I'm reading it. But <clears throat> it's also really helpful to just have it in front of you so that when I'm talking through it, you can actually see what I'm referencing. And hopefully that'll help you make sense of it, whether that be a, a physical Bible um, or if you just have one on your phone, I don't judge either way. Um, but we're going to go into Revelation 18 verses 1 through 8. And as we go, it says, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped as high as heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others. And repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And that is, uh, that's the first eight verses of Revelation 18. So what we're seeing here is, First and foremost, this, this angel coming down from heaven. And John is witnessing this. This is a different angel than the one that has been guiding John both recently and throughout the book of Revelation. 
this angel is coming directly from the presence of God, which is evidenced by the fact that he has, he has so much glory that the earth is made bright with it. And when, when we're seeing that much glory, it's, it's reflective of being in the presence of God. And what this angel is doing is, well, actually what we see angels described this way doing throughout Revelation, these mighty angels, is they're announcing the mission of God and, and the final judgment of his enemies. And as we, as we move forward, he speaks with a mighty voice. So this word, it doesn't just mean loud. He's not just speaking with a loud voice. He's speaking authoritatively. He's speaking on behalf of God. His words are accomplishing something. His words are prophetic. So that's what we see as we see this angel come down and then speak these words of judgment on Babylon which is another name given to the prostitute, to the faithless one, is, is Babylon. Um, and it goes from this, this place where she dwells, this city, this great city that's kind of representative of, of frankly, false spirituality, of, of some perversion of the church that leads people away from Christ. And it's destroyed to the point where only scavengers remain. And we see that in the second part of this, uh, a haunt for every unclean bird and for every unclean and detestable uh, beast. And those we think of as, as animals like vultures and hyenas and stuff, scavengers, who, who are the only thing left in a place of desolation where there's nothing but corpses and, and then things that live off the corpses. And then we, but before that we see kind of demons, or not kind of, we see a haunt for demons and unclean spirits so we we kind of have this connection of demons almost as spiritual scavengers and th this could refer to literal demons kind of going through uh those who were trapped in the city um or it could be just the memories of all that was lost in this city kind of the the tortured souls that are doomed to hell because they they stuck with this faithlessness um, and, and what is crazy here is this was a servant of the devil. So we see once, once she, once the false church, once the faithless one has outlived her purpose, she is left for dead. There, there is nothing left but desolation there. Um, which I, I suppose is all that's to be expected from serving Satan. Um, but that's what we have a picture of here. And then the, the angel gives a reason for this. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. The kings of the earth have committed immorality. Um, and it's this, this faithless version of Christianity that has given politicians and economic rulers freedom to live immorally. It, that's kind of what the symbolism of this is talking about. It, it's talking about this false version of the church not leading people to Christ, but leading people to fulfill their sinful nature, to live in that sinful nature, to thrive in a certain kind of way of speaking in that sinful nature. And I think this hits home a little bit for modern Christianity, because there is is this tendency, this temptation for to, to use Christianity to excuse and equip and enable sinful living to uh, encourage greed and, and grabs for power and, and self-centeredness. And it exists. It is out there. It's, it's popular, actually, um, because it tells you, it tells us, it, or it tries to tell us, live your life how you want. Um, but that is what the faithless one is being punished for. So he hears uh, another voice from heaven. And this is speak, God speaking to his people. And, and almost everywhere else in Revelation, we see angels speaking on behalf of God. But right here we see God speaking. And, and we know that it's God speaking because it says, come out of her, my people. God's faithful people don't belong to the angels. They don't belong to other entities in heaven, to the saints, to the four living creatures. No, they are God's people. And he is calling them out of Babylon. Lest you take part in your sins lest you share in her plagues 
It's a call for his people to come out and to escape the judgment that is coming. This is consistent with the prophets in the whole New Testament. As God prepares to judge, there's this, uh, in, in the Old Testament, there was an instance where some of the Israelites lived unfaithfully. And God was preparing to punish them. But beforehand, he warned all of the other people of Israel, back away from the dwellings of these men. And as, as they were consumed by the earth, as they literally sank into the earth, the faithful of Israel were, were told to back up first. And in the New Testament, again and again, there's this warning, like, distance yourself from these places of sin. Um, and there is this call to be in the world, but not of the world, to not live in, because we're called to a better life. You and I, were forgiven in Christ. We, we have repented of our sins, and Christ forgives us, and he welcomes us into his family, into a relationship with him with open arms. But the reality of that is that we're called to a life that's better. So I, I actually have a question for you because this, this I think, gives us a little bit of uh, a balance to be struck. In that, how should Christians interact with non-believers? And, and that's the question I have for you. Um, how should Christians interact with non-believers? Is, is it possible for someone to be outside of the faith, someone who we would need to reach out to the with the gospel without them living a life that draws people away from God. Um, I, I would say yes, because I have friends who have not, they have not challenged my relationship with Christ. They have not pulled me away from my relationship with Christ, but they are not themselves believers. And, and I have missional opportunities with them. So, so my question is in all of this, how do we balance faithfully living this way with faithfully living in mission as we are, as we are called to do? In that we should be distancing ourselves from, from sin and those who would draw us away from Christ. But at the same time, we're called to reach out to those people and to bring them back to Christ. So that's, that's a discussion for you. Um, so with that, continuing through this text, it talks about the, it goes back to speaking of the faithless one. Her sins are, are heaped high as heaven. Her sins are piled high. This is so, this is such a, a quantity of sin, an overwhelming amount of sin that God can no longer put up with it. And, and he goes forward and he speaks to her punishment. And he says, she's going to suffer twice what, what she has done to my people. She has suffered, she will suffer a double portion. Um, and these are commands to the agents of God's punishment. This is not you and I, these, this is to the angels that are carrying out God's judgment. Um, and, and in fact, to some of the servant, her servants who, as we saw in 17, are going to rise up and kind of, I guess, be a threat from inside. Um, and God is commanding them. She is going to suffer twice what she has wrought. And we see here there's a direct correlation between her boasts and her punishments. Her, her luxury, her pride, her all, all these things that she's boasting. She then suffers punishment that's it's pretty directly connected to that. And then as we get to the end of this, these first verses, it says her plagues will come in a single day. And what this is communicating is it's going to be sudden and overwhelming. All of these terrible things are going to happen all at once. When God's judgment comes, it is going to be swift and powerful and overwhelming. And, and that is what is, is being promised to this great enemy of God's people. So, as we move forward, we're in these next few verses, what we're going to see is we're going to see the reaction of, of the world and of those who were kind of in league with the faithless one. So, as we do that, we're going to move into Revelation 18. 9 through 19. And it says, And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. 
cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, and bronze, and iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses, and chariots, and slaves, that is, human souls. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and your delicacies and splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels, and with pearls. For in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea, they stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour, she has been laid waste. And that is what we, that is what we see in these, um, that's what we see in these next verses. And the reality to this is we see a, a variety of people who benefited, who were, I guess, in league with uh, the faithless one, are, are mourning her loss. So first we see the kings of the earth. And they're, they're mourning over the loss of their lover, of this person who kind of enabled them to do all the things they do. This, this false church that equipped them, that supported them, that enabled them, that um, gave them permission to rule. They're mourning over the loss of all that, but they're also mourning because her sin was their own. It, it, it was a, a back and forth, equal kind of equal opportunity sin relationship. And there, there is this reality that the, the political powers of the world will mourn at the loss of this false church because it equips them and it builds them up. So that's what we see with the kings. And then we go forward and we see the merchants of the earth are also mourning. These, this is representative of the economic powers that be. Because when the faithless one falls, they lose the source of their wealth. And, and it, it goes through this whole list of their wealth that has faded. And this is just what the New Testament teaches. It, it says, don't put your faith, don't put your trust in, in things that moth and rust destroy and that thieves can break in and steal. They're mourning the loss of all of this wealth when the, the New Testament warns over and over again, don't put your faith in your wealth. And this is definitely something that we can see today kind of in this false church. We see the prosperity gospel is incredibly popular. This idea that you believe in, in God and he'll somehow make you wealthy and powerful and he'll give you what you want and he'll get you that new car and that new house, and that bigger house, and that boat, whatever. And, and you're putting your trust in, in the wealth instead of in God Almighty. So this, this is a reality of the false church that I think is very apparent in, in the world that you and I live in. And as we go, there's this long list of all of the goods that are, I guess, no longer bought and sold. And they're kind of representative. You see things representative of money. Kind of this reality of monetary uh, exchange. You have objects, goods, you have foods and spices, and then you have people and services. So kind of this, this covers pretty much all of, of economic trade uh, fits into one of these categories. And this list is representative of that. So we see the power of the economic uh, rulers that comes from the false religions Um also crumbling. And I think what is really interesting is some of the focus of, of this list are items that at the time would have been made into idols. You see ivory, you see wood and, and the precious metals and, and purple cloth and scarlet cloth. These would have been involved with idol worship. So there, there's this 
also very direct connection between, I guess, the worship of wealth and the worship of idols. And that's what we have with the merchants. And then it goes to the seafarers, which again, they're, they're lamenting a loss of wealth that comes from the fall of the faithless one. But there's also a connection to the ancient city of Tyre. If you go in the Old Testament, the city of Tyre is overthrown by God in, in a very similar way as we see the symbolic city of the faithless one overthrown here. And the the seafarers mourn in exactly the same way in that text. So it's something kind of interesting we see as we go forward in that um, there's this consistency. So with this being said, with this section on kind of how people are lamenting and mourning the loss of the false church, I, I have a reflection for you. And this... Like before, this isn't a question I want you to respond to in the comments. If you want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me, feel free to reach out if you want to talk about this, if you're burdened by this. But I want to talk about, or I want you to reflect on, do you fall into any of these categories? Do you put your trust in, in politics and political power? Do you put your trust in wealth and the economy? Uh, do, you, do you place your trust in all these kind of fancy things that we've built up? Um, and do you take advantage of false Christianity? Do you take license to do things that you really, you know, you shouldn't because you can find some justification from someone using Christianity, using scripture in a way that they shouldn't be, or do you put your faith in something that you shouldn't be? I think that this, this is being recorded obviously in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic and a lot of things are being taken away. There, there are a lot of struggles in, in areas in the economy, in, in the, the political sphere. And it's causing a lot of people anxiety. But I think what this is an opportunity to do is examine why is it causing you so much anxiety? And, and maybe to examine in yourself, have you been putting too much faith in, in these various things? Because God hasn't changed because of the virus. So if your faith is in God, there's only so much that you can really be shaken because God is not shaken by this. Um, not saying that we're unaffected by everything going on around us, but we, we have kind of that grounding place in our faith. So that's just a quick reflection I have for you. And from there, we're going to move into Revelation 18 and we're going to see the reaction of God's people. Uh, Revelation 18 verse 20, which says, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. So this is this is a, a single verse. I'm not even going to cut back to myself. This is a call to celebration that really contrasts with the kind of the mourning, lamenting dirge that precedes it, the, the words that precede it, because the enemy of the church has been overthrown. God has given judgment against the faithless one, for his saints. This is justice on behalf of God's people. And that's verse 20. And then in verse 21, we, we see uh, more action on behalf of God because we see a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea saying, so will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more in the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeteers, it will be heard in you no more, and a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. The sound of the mill will be heard in you no more, and the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. The voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more, for your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints, of all who had been slain on the earth. And that's where we see the conclusion of this chapter. First, we see this mighty angel. And again, this is noteworthy in God's presence. The, the five angels that are described like this in Revelation all play a role in, in the church's mission on earth. And we see it casting this stone into the sea. And the reality of this is um, it's violent. So we see the violent downfall of the faithless one, of Babylon. But... 
if you throw something into the ocean, it disappears and it's, it's very difficult. It, it, if it's a rock, it's probably impossible to find it again. And there's, that's the connection that's being made is, is Babylon, Babylon's overthrow is so complete and so total that, that there's n no trace of it anymore. There's no trace of Babylon, of the prostitute, of the faithless one, and, and all the evil that came with that. All of that temptation to be pulled away from Christ, it's gone. Never to come back. Which, which is a break from what we've seen so far, because previously there's this beast that's it's described as being mortally wounded in the head, and then it comes back and that draws even more people to it. This is, this is saying, no, this is, this is it. This is the final judgment. The faithless one is no more. God's people no longer have anything to fear from her, from it. And this is because of the evil that she has done against God's people, which is what this closes on. It reminds people why she had to suffer this way. For, for her evil, for its evil against God's people, she's destroyed completely. God's judgment is and justice is complete for his people. And that's what we see this end on. We see this final judgment where God is saying, I have heard the cries of my people and I am acting on their behalf. This great threat to them, these great temptations, they are gone. And, and that's where we close this chapter. Um, and that's where we close chapter 18. Uh, I hope this was helpful to you. If you do have any more questions or, or comments or concerns that, you're, that you want a, a more open discussion on, Please comment below. Just type your comment in. I, I check. I'll, I'll go back and I'll do my best to answer them. If it's something you, you want a more personal answer to, feel free to reach out to me. You, you can text me. You can message me on Facebook. Um, or if you want, you can email me. That's vicar at stpaulboca.com. V-I-C-A-R at stpaulboca.com. Um, so that's the conclusion of chapter 18. What I want to put before you now is uh, is just a quick rundown of some of the other resources you can find in this site. See, if you look below, there there's a button. There's a button. It's a red button. It should it says one of two things. It either says subscribe or it's kind of grayed out and it says unsubscribe. If it says unsubscribe, don't click it. But if it still says subscribe, I'd encourage you to click it. And here's why. Um, I'm not the only one who publishes Bible studies and devotions and other things to this, this YouTube page. This is St. Paul Lutheran Church and Schools YouTube page. And every Sunday we have live worship at 9 o'clock and 1045. 9 o'clock is a, is a more contemporary service. 10, 1045 is a more traditional service. Um, and you can watch live stream. We, we have the music. We have the liturgy. We have uh, the prayers and the, the messages and the readings and everything and and you don't need anything you just need to watch it because the words are all there so we have that um and that's every weekend we also there's a bible study that's going to be coming out by pastor andrew on the foundations in faith that kind of gets us back to the basics on what do we believe as christians what, what does what does saint paul lutheran church and school teach um so we're gonna have that daily devotions by pastor steve right now he's working through matthew um, there's a podcast that comes out every Thursday that uh, talks about real world issues. So there's a ton of material and it's all on St. Paul's YouTube page. So I would encourage you subscribe so you get notified when that, that material is coming out. Um, but also just explore the YouTube page. It, it's all organized so it's pretty easy to find whatever you're looking for. And I would encourage you take this opportunity to get deeper into the word. Um, to connect in ways that maybe you wouldn't be able to connect otherwise. So uh, that... That's where I'm going to leave this, this Bible study. Uh, again, I hope it was helpful. And with that, brothers and sisters, I do encourage you, uh, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.